Hello, everybody. Welcome to ASBN Live. This is episode 124, Federal Contracting 101. This is a special webinar because it's brought to us by one of our members, Dan Turner. And just as a reminder, if you are an ASBN member, you are all welcome to pitch some ideas if there is a topic you think would be interesting to our membership. These are open to the public. So we welcome you to send an email to me, Felicity at asbnnetwork.org, and I'm happy to help make that happen. So I would now like to turn it over to Daniel Turner to introduce the panelists that he's brought together for this awesome presentation. Take it away, Dan. Thanks, Felicity. So uh, this is Federal Contracting 101 for B Corps. If you in intended to be somewhere else, leave. So uh, the objectives of this presentation, we're going to work on convincing you how great government contracting is and that, that you should start doing it right now. We're also going to convince you how ridiculous and horrible government contracting is and you should never do it and run away. We're going to discuss being a B Corp government contractor and then we'll take questions. The initial part we figure is going to be 15 to 20 minutes and then we'll take as many questions as you have. Who are we? So I'm Dan Turner. I'm the CEO of TCG. Uh, we're a government contractor um, for 28 years. Ben is the CEO of Fours Marsh, government contractor for a long time. 20 years. 20 years. Got you beat, but just a little bit. Uh, Kristen, uh, CEO of Rescue Agency, government contractor for? 10 plus years. Oh, the noob. All right. So uh, we're gonna go a little bit about, we're gonna talk a little bit about ourselves and then we'll get into it. So TCG is, uh, we're an IT government contractor. We do uh, uh, work all over the federal government. Um, we thought that we'd highlight one thing that we did that was uh, particularly noteworthy that we find good. And so uh, we picked our Office of Government Ethics work. We created, the, there's a website called integrity.gov, which has the best name ever. Which is used. And Dan has a great slide to share it. Just click a couple slides oh, ahead and we'll make sure that we share all your great work, Dan. You're right. Thank you. I'm clicking the wrong slides at the wrong one. My talking slides instead of the seeing slides. So, uh, Office of Government Ethics. So, it's used to process financial disclosures of senior government executives and political appointees. Um, uh, so, that what this means is that anytime anybody joins the federal government at a high enough level, they're filling out a form and our system is processing it. You can see the results of those forms. They're very exciting usually. Uh, we we uh, work with, or Office of Government Ethics works with the government officials to eliminate their financial conflicts of interest. And, uh, and then we built it for them. So Ben? Yeah, so yeah, first it's a pleasure speaking with everyone today. Uh, yeah, uh, we are a research uh, communications and consulting firm. Uh, uh, about 400 employees now, and we started off, uh, you know, with two, and as a subcontractor, largely it was four years to become a prime contractor of the government, uh, and we've been doing that ever since. Uh, I highlighted a few projects. I'll talk them real quickly. The the one on the left here, I highlight because it's our most recent bit of work, uh, and that's a campaign we launched only a few weeks ago for the National Institute of Neurological Disease and Stroke with the NIH. We'll go Tongue. Uh, this is an education campaign on the importance of controlling high blood pressure earlier in life to reduce risk of uh, stroke and dementia later on. The middle one I highlight because it's our biggest project we've done in our, in our company's uh, life, and that's the We Can Do This campaign, that, which we led alongside HHS and several other agencies, and that's a national initiative to build uh, public confidence, uptake of COVID vaccines. Um, you may have seen these ads on TV or at the bus stop or online on the radio. And uh, yeah, that was brought to you by your friendly B Corp, uh, Fours Marsh. Uh, and finally, uh, I have you know, maybe not quite as exciting, but just as important a uh, cover from a report we produced and delivered to the president. And that is uh, under a contract that we are responsible for delivering, studying, uh, delivering now reports on prevalence of assault and sexual assault and harassment in the US military uh, presents those key measures which are uh, maintaining transparency and accountability and help identifying what evidence-based interventions can drive those numbers down. So a few examples of the work we're doing as a government contractor and B Corp. And I think I turn it to Kristen now. That's great. Thanks, Ben. Yeah. Kristen? 
Wonderful. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, so Rescue Agency is a marketing and communications organization. We're about 200 employees all over the country. Due to COVID, we just we have a more distributed workforce, as many do at this point. Um, but we've been around since 2001, so uh, we're 21 years old. In the world that we live within, which is public health, that's a milestone age to become 21. We can drink now, so that's exciting. Um, but more importantly, um, you know, throughout our history, we've had a very clear mission. Our mission is to make healthy behaviors easier and more appealing. We work exclusively with uh, public health agencies at the federal, state, and county level, nonprofits, as well as health systems. And we work across issues like tobacco control, uh, mental health, substance misuse disorder, early childhood education, nutrition and obesity prevention and food insecurity. Um, so all of our campaigns begin with research. Um, we became a, a federal contractor back in 2012 when we won a small business set aside for the FDA Center for Tobacco Products. And it was a $150 million contract over a period of five years. At that point in time, we were a small little agency. We were about 30 to 40 people. And so we benefited from that small business set aside. And that opportunity really catapulted us into a larger organization where we could uh, you know, fulfill our mission in a broader way. Um, back at that time, um, you know, when we were 30 people, uh, I came on board as the CEO and we scaled the agency to launch a multicultural youth tobacco prevention campaign and then an LGBT young adult tobacco prevention and cessation campaign. And just last week, um, you'll see here on the left-hand side, we launched our third campaign with the FDA and it's called Next Legends. It's a new youth e-cigarette prevention campaign that aims to educate American Indian and Alaskan native, native youth ages 12 to 17 about the harms of vaping. And this was a long time coming. This project really took um, you know, five to eight years to come to fruition. We did an enormous amount of research out in the field with native tribes, community leaders and young adults and teens themselves. Um, and so it was really exciting to see this campaign launch last week. You can see some of the billboards, some of the Snapchat filters, and it's gonna be a very targeted effort because um, Native American teens are disproportionately targeted and disproportionately use tobacco and vaping from a commercial point of view. So that's important. We became a B Corp in 2014 because we wanted to make sure that our mission as we grew stayed intact and that no matter where we went with our, uh, our mission, that we could always depend on the standards from a B Corp perspective. And over the years, as we've grown with the FDA, we've been able to do work through the USDA with many states where the USDA funds nutrition and obesity prevention. We've been able to do work through SAMHSA grants and we've been able to do work with the CDC on everything from research to antimicrobial resistance and all kinds of interesting topics. So we've been able to stay really true to our mission to make healthy behaviors easier and more appealing, both as a federal contractor and as a B Corp. And so with that, I'll pass it over to Dan. Thanks, Jesse. So uh, as you can see, we, we all believe that uh, government is, uh, can be a force for good in the world. Uh, and so um, it's not every, people don't always think about, B, about government as a purpose-driven organization. It is. I found this quote on the, on the internet. Uh, Purpose-driven organizations exist not solely to maximize profit or increase shareholder value, but also to make a lasting beneficial impact on the world. They measure success based on how significant an impact they have on the specific global issues they're trying to influence. If you think about government, pretty much everything government does is purpose-driven by this definition and by almost any definition. Um, government is, is, uh, is not, not always, not every government, but most of the time, and certainly our government, is almost always a force for good and is very purpose driven. So, who's buying stuff from the government, from us, from government contractors? Everybody, everybody buys stuff. Everyone in the government. The government is the largest buyer of goods and services in the world with uh, some four, what's, uh, what's our annual budget? $4 trillion. A lot of that's in contracts. A lot of it's in grants and uh, a lot of it's in employees, but uh, the third largest part of it is contracts. And so those are the places where we can get money to help them do the things that they need to do. What do they buy everything? I mean, uh, you can see here a list of things. If you sell military aircraft, they buy it. 
not sure who else she's selling it to. Uh, construction and highway maintenance, they do, they buy equipment, buildings, services, education, research, trainings, everything. They buy everything. So all these sound really good. So let's go into why federal contracting is good. So first off, it's subject to the FAR. The FAR is a list of regulations, a lot of regulations, 52 volumes of regulations that uh, are based on laws in most cases, if not based on uh, re regulations that the government itself has set up and other requirements. Uh, this represents a really big moat. If you follow uh, uh, Michael Porter's work, uh, having a moat around the work that you do means that you uh, that other people have difficulty uh, competing with you. And lower competition means that you can have a happier day. Uh, usually, all of their work is purchased through RFPs, requests for proposals, which also means there are lots of rules. Um, what that leads to is limited shenanigans. So when, uh, a, when, a when the government wants to purchase something, they have to put out a, a request for proposals and everybody needs to be on a level playing field. Everyone who receives the proposal and is, is uh, eligible to respond uh, needs to have the same data. And so they're very careful about that. Um, and if you do work for Amazon or AT&T or Walmart and the, the procurement officer awards it to their cousin, the procurement officer might get fired. But if that happens in the government, the procurement officer is going to jail. So there's a very large disincentive to anything bad. And that's really good for, uh, for companies like ours. They pay quickly, usually, uh, within 30 days or with interest. Um, and that's kind of nice. I actually just got interest this morning on, on a bill. Not a lot of interest, but a hundred bucks was not bad for nothing, effectively, for, for uh, having an invoice out for 32 days. Uh, long contracts are normal. Five years is typical. So it takes a lot of work to get a proposal, to get an RFP or a proposal done. But um, once you have it, you keep it for a long time. There are set-asides, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit later, but there are small business set-asides, there's woman-owned small business set-asides, there's uh, uh, minority-owned, there's uh, Alaska Native or uh, American Indian-owned. Um, there's a uh, hub's uh, hub historically underutilized business zone owned or uh, set cited businesses. So there's all these set asides that the government has a goal of awarding a certain percentage of their work to. And, um, and so if you qualify for one of those, then it can be easier to get the work and you can get advantages in your bids. They answer, the government answers to Congress and the American people, uh, which is good and bad. It's a little scary that they answer to that you have to answer to Congress. If you do something wrong, then Congress is going to call you and ask you to come testify and be mad at you. But it means that they they are really focused on their purpose and uh, their their goals of uh, helping the American people. There's extremely significant transparency. Every award that's made is uh, well, except for the the ones that are uh, secret or top secret. Every award that's made is available online uh, and uh, is well researched by lots of people, including lots of companies that that uh, charge for access to their data. Um, we all, I'm sure, all three of us uh, subscribe to services that do that, and so we, you can get information on who won last time, how much they, how much the award was for, um, uh, how long the contract was for, uh, and how long they've been working on. It. Very helpful. And many, not all, but almost all banks love lending to government contractors because of all of these things. It's, it's very likely that they'll, the money will get paid back. So that all sounds great, right? So what's the bad news? Well, there's a lot. Uh, it's subject to the FAR. So there are lots and lots and lots of rules. So many rules. Uh, all procurement is done through RFP, not through relationships, except when they are. Um, Typically, it, it, because it has to be done through an RFP, if you have a relationship with a client, it, gets you, it might get you access to the RFP, but it doesn't necessarily get you an award, no matter how much they like you. That still has to go through a technical evaluation panel, and that evaluation panel is made up of people you don't know, you're not allowed to know who they are, and you will never know who they are. And so uh, marketing directly to them is extremely difficult. If you've ever been uh, around the Pentagon, um, if you ever get off the Metro at the Pentagon, you'll see huge ads about particular procurements. Those are targeted at one or two people. Those, those enormous billboards are 
focused on those one or two people because those are the only two people who have any idea what those billboards are about. And that's all that's important. Those two people are the ones who make the decisions. The government can cancel a, a contract at any time. We've all had, all three of us have had contracts canceled, even five-year contracts. Sometimes they cancel them after a year or two years or a month. They can cancel it at will. And they, they, they're required to give you some equity, they're required to pay for your costs to shut down, but not very much. And so it doesn't, it doesn't go very far. The government can see your profit at will and then negotiate with that profit in mind. Uh, and that, um, that's, that sounds insane and it's insane. Um, it means that the government can push down your profits pretty far because they can know what they are. They can audit you at will. We've, we've all been audited by various places. Uh, we're in the middle of a GSA audit, that's not fun. Um, and so they can come in and audit your contract. They can audit the work that you're doing. They can audit your invoicing. Um, and, uh, and typically they're going, to, they're, they're going to find something because that's their job. They can force, I mean, encourage competition with your partners during recompetes. You actually, uh, uh, the FAR says that you're not actually allowed to put in a non-compete with your subcontractors. Um, so if you have a subcontractor on a project, and the project comes up for recompete, which it does every five years or whatever, uh, you can't stop that subcontractor from bidding against you. You can stop them from bidding against you and also being on your team, but you can't stop them from leaving your team and bidding against you with all the knowledge they've gained up during that time, which is good and bad. <clears throat> it's good because if, as a subcontractor, it means you have a chance to win the contract next round. Uh, and it's bad because maybe you don't want to have as many subcontractors. The government can force you to give up employees to the winners. So if you have a contract, and you're doing a good job on it, and you you lose anyway at the recompete. Um, you can't stop your employees. In fact, you're required to let the new company know who all of your employees are, and then solicit your employees. And you can't stop them from leaving. It's great. Margins tend to be small uh, because they know your profits, and because there's good competition. Margins tend to be relatively small. There are ways to, to make it larger if you're a, a sole source, if you're the only people who offering a product. Um, other than that, your, your margins are going to be relatively small because they know what they are. There's a two-year sales cycle. So you, you hear about something, two years later, you might get a chance to bid on it. Or might, a year later, we might get a chance to bid on it, and it might be two years until they award it. We just actually won an award for something that we bid on two years ago. You never know. Uh, so every, pro, every uh, contract, once it's awarded, can be protested. In fact, it can be protested even before it's awarded. Um, generally speaking, people uh, companies have 10 days to protest after an award is made. So, but uh, if a protest comes in, then it basically postpones the, the award for 90 days. And so you're just sitting around waiting. And if they, they find that there's something there, then the procurement might end up having to be canceled entirely, or they may have to redo the procurement, or they may have to ask for more data. It's very exciting. Elections can influence contract direction or progress. So uh, this means um, sometimes your favorite candidate for president or whatever doesn't win. Uh, and when that happens- According to the Associated Press, shush, Democrat Joe Biden- Sorry. Biden. Sorry, Alexa wanted to tell me the results of the last election. So I appreciate that, uh, but not right now. Uh, elections can influence contract direction, as I said. So uh, if a, a, a new person comes in, they assign a new boss to your agency. That boss can say, we, that's no longer the direction that we want this agency to go. We're gonna cancel that contract and start over. We've all had that happen. And last, there's an alphabet soup. There's, uh, so I, we like to say there's TLAs and then there's ETLAs. There's three letter acronyms and then there's extended three letter acronyms. And uh, they're, they're rampant throughout the government. So how can B Corps benefit from this? First off, we uh, are different from other government contractors. That, that differentiation can be exciting to a client. Not all clients care, but more and more are, are interested in, in that information. Uh, the, the benefits that we give our employees, there's no competition within the government. So if somebody works at a government contractor, uh, for instance, on one of those projects that we went away from another company, 
the employees are generally very excited about coming to work for us because our benefits are substantially better than whatever they're being offered. And of course, there's purpose alignment. Um, when, you, when you are a contractor and your purpose is aligned with your client's purpose, the, the, uh, the synergies can be very exciting, to use a terrible business word. And of course, uh, our, our, we have a secret goal uh, that I'm going to tell you what it is uh, of doing this presentation. And that is that if we can get enough government contractors interested in being a B Corps and enough B Corps interested in being government contractors, then maybe we can convince the government to make B Corp certification a preference or a set aside, meaning it would be easier for B Corps to win work from the government. We think this is uh, useful, important, and valuable to both B Corps and to the government. And so we're, uh, we're very quietly pushing it, and I've just pushed it more loudly, so there you go. Because federal contracting currently recognizes small businesses, 8As, female and veteran-owned, uh, 8As, minority-owned, sorry, uh, female-owned, veteran-owned, Native American, Alaskan Native, and historically underutilized business zones, um, they all get preferences. Next should be certified B Corps. So how do you get started? Oh, there's a slide I meant to show you. Now it's done. So how do you get started? Uh, start with SAM.gov. Um, you need to register as a government contractor anyway. It's not very hard. You need a, a UID, whatever they call them now. Um, used to be called a, uh, a, a DUNS number. That's something different now. Uh, so you need to register. And that, through that, you can follow all the opportunities that, and every opportunity is supposed to be put out on SAM.gov. So uh, you should be, you'll be, see lots of opportunities. Don't bid on them because you'll lose. Um, that thing, uh, the, the movie War Dogs, where they just bid on Fed biz ops stuff, that's not a thing anymore. You'll, you'll, unless you're making um, something that's uh, really easy to make, like you're selling widgets that everyone else sells, then you might win conceivably. But uh, if you're selling anything else, you're not gonna win. There's a, 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 an incumbent who already has more information, more intel on what's going on than you do. And so they'll put the right things into their proposal and you'll not even know that it's supposed to be in there. So instead, start, start with SAM, then research the contracts, research the categories, research the people, uh, talk to the SBA, um, uh, and then think about bidding. You can also, as an alternative, create a relationship with the existing federal contractor. You can be a subcontractor. Contact us. We're all prime contractors. We love having subcontractors. It's great. So that's, uh, that's our slides. Um, let's uh, take some questions. We have four. Oh, goody. These look fun. OK, so uh, I'm just going to start at the top, and I'm going to try to assign them to somebody. But uh, if I can, I'm not sure who to assign this first one to. I earned a letter of recommendation from Congress for contacting small business with federal government while an intern for CA-10. I don't know what CA-10 is. Is that a California? Um, uh, an area of California. Now I'm a small business owner seeking an ally. How can I use my endorsement to leverage pre-seed money and contacts as a black woman? Either of you want to take this? I think, you know, as a starting point, um, if you go back to the, the slide where we showed some of the preferences, you know, as a black woman and as a small business, um, there are places that you can register for small business um, recognition. There we go as well as women-owned small businesses. So the first place that, that I would start is by going to those pages and actually going through that registration process because you are able to then get that designation. And in many cases, they're asking for letters of recommendation, they're asking for, for referrals and proof of your work. And that, uh, that letter of reference or that commendation will be really helpful in that process. Uh, okay. So the next question was, I noticed no black leaders in your contracting role. Why is that? And what do you plan to do about white supremacy? I noticed the language and cultural group that created the social issues we have are the ones claiming to want to fix it. Why not allow those impacted for 600 years to fix? Do you plan to give up or share power? Okay. Um, so I couldn't find any government contractors who were also B Corps who are also uh, African-American or black. So uh, if you know any, happy to talk to them. Um, I just didn't know. 
Yeah, and I think, I mean, I can, I can talk a little bit about our work. I mean, one of the things that we do as a partner to the federal government is really give voice to some of those other organizations. For example, I shared the Next Legends um, campaign that we just launched. That work was done in partnership with a Native American agency, as well as in partnership with tribes and community members all over the country. So at the same time, you know, I'm here because I have the federal contract. At the end of the day, the work is representative of that community. And during the launch last week, for example, there was a Native American youth, there was a Native American social worker, and their voices are the loudest voices and the most important voices for launching this campaign. And that's something that we try to do every single time, which is just provide that platform so that those voices can be amplified. I think that's a simple answer. It's a much deeper question, but it's really important in terms of recognizing how we can you know fix and, and change some of the wrongs the the role that every single one of us has to play in amplifying those voices around us and providing that visibility i don't know dan or ben if you have anything else to add there i mean i think you're talking to leaders from uh, only a few b corps in this government contracting community and you know, by nature of our b corp certification we are firms that are committed in the way we run our business to building a regenerative, equitable, and inclusive economy. And so uh, I, I think it's a great question. I think it's something that we set our businesses out to uh, work towards addressing every day we're around. And part of the reason we're doing meetings like this is to bring more people into this government contracting arena from more places than are there now, because I think it is a problem and we, we want to fix it, be a part of it. Great. Thanks, Ben. Uh, I agree with both of you. You're exactly right. Okay, next question. When you say margins are small, can you give us a percentage idea of what that means? <laughs> that is a hard question. Well, um, <laughs> not in this <laughs> <laughs> I can give an opinion on this. What I have seen, what I have seen, and obviously it ranges, it ranges, but I would say six to 12 percent at a corporate side pre-tax is what vast majority of government contractors are in. Contract type matters, uh, how established you are in demand of price premium matters, all of that matters. But if you think six to 12, if you're, if you're doing 25 percent, you think you're going to make that in government sector? You might be disappointed. Yeah, six to twelve is about right. When you get larger, uh, the the larger the company, the lower the the profit margin. So uh, overall, so Northrop's making three to six percent. So if if you're uh, yeah in, in commercial work, I know my my friends in commercial work are getting twenty to twenty five percent for the same work we're doing. Yeah, and you know, sorry, Dan. Sorry, Dan. <laughs> one, one, one comment I'll make, though, I say is, you know, certainly the, there's a, um, a, a match, at least in the government contract type, with the fee uh, and the margin you make and the type of risk and the amount of risk you're taking on. So these bigger co cost plus contracts, you are reimbursed for every dollar you spend plus uh, uh, a fee on top. So you're not taking on a lot of risk for that percentage. Now, for the fixed price contract, you are taking the risk on, and you can see some higher margins, certainly if you're efficient in your delivery, yep. but it has the risk to go. The, the government, uh, so in, in our experience, the government either uses cost plus contracts, meaning they know exactly what their cost is, and you tell them exactly what the cost is, and then you get to charge a little bit on top of those costs. Um, that gives you the lowest margin. Time and materials contracts. Uh, where you can set a rate, but it generally needs to be based more or less on your costs, um, but they don't check very often. So uh, you can set it a little higher and you make a little bit more on profit. Um, and then fixed price contracts where you can, the, the sky's a little bit on profit, although they're gonna argue. Um, you can conceivably make a thousand percent profit if you, you could do something that they wanted that much. But uh, the government doesn't really like fixed price contracts. They say they do, they don't. At least in my experience. Is it a good idea to, uh, so here's another question. Is it a good idea to use one of these services to help you find contracts? These services, like uh, I mentioned Sam.gov, um, uh, like you mean like the services that say they're gonna help you find contracts? I assume that's what you mean. Um, 
I have had zero luck with it. Have, have you guys, Kristen or Ben, any luck? No, I mean, we've, we've looked at all the services and we've looked at, you know, contracting. I think the most important thing to start with is really to recognize what category of opportunity your services play within and then find those federal agencies that, you know, kind of are, are releasing those RFPs. It is a little bit like a needle in a haystack having to look for those RFPs, but you can set alerts so that you're alerted to what those are. The services are gener generally just aggregators of those alerts. And I wouldn't necessarily pay for that in advance. Uh, I think the first start is you know, registering on SAM. If you go to that page that has the three places to start, registering on SAM, registering through the Small Business Association and women-owned small businesses. A lot of times, one of the other ways that small businesses can get started, and I mentioned this a little bit, it's either through a set-aside contract or through a subcontractor. And being a subcontractor to a prime government contractor is a great way to establish um, a history and establish, uh, you know, a work preference that you can then use to win other pieces of business. So it really is just starting to understand through this page and then the following page that provides you with the specific links, understanding what types of opportunities fall within the categories of business that you serve, and then making sure that you follow up with it almost on a monthly or quarterly basis so that you can see what's released and then match your services to what's being looked for. So uh, next, uh, another question from Michelle. You got lots of good questions, Michelle. Any idea for finding primes? Just looking at who wins contracts. Yes, that is right. Look at who wins contracts. That's how you find a prime. Go to, go to conferences. Ben and Kristen, you both have ideas, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, I think you have to search every, every angle of the network you have. I mean, if it's a fellow B Corp, and there's a lot of us, but that's one, if people locally, uh, there's also most government agencies have uh, a small business office, uh, office of uh, small and, and disadvantaged business utilization, usually they're called. They have websites, they have POCs, they will take meetings. Those are the people that will take meetings. Now, if you're a large business and you're the commercial side and you want to get into uh, government, it's a little harder, but I, I'm not shedding that many tears for you. You're already large and successful. Small business, get in with those small business, uh, the small business offices. They can set you up with primes. They often have lists. They can give you some indication. Maybe if some opportunities are coming out, they will help you. That's, that's exactly right. Uh, the OSDBUs, OSDBUs, are fantastic. They're, they're, they live to get small businesses work in their agency. And there's one in every agency, I think. Every agency we've ever talked to. I think there's one in every agency. Uh, there's, a, there's a question, which isn't actually a question. Anyone want to be an ally to me for mentorship? I am here. Great. Um, I would suggest talking to uh, SPOR and SBA. Um, the Small Business Administration will hook you up with, um, with uh, primes who are interested in having uh, uh, mentor proteges. Uh, um, there's something called a, an MPA, a mentor protege agreement, where if you are a smaller business, and you uh, um, want to work with a larger business, uh, the, the prime has certain responsibilities and certain requirements. Not the prime, the large business, it's actually not a prime. And you end up forming, you can form a joint venture together. And that joint venture can bid as a small business. So we actually have a, I, I, we're, I'm involved in one with uh, another company and we actually just won a contract that's a, 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 set, a small business set aside. Um, and uh, we'll be able to get work through that. But we can only get less than half of the work. So half the work is going to our, our protege um, and that will make our protege larger. That's good for our protege and good for business in general. Yeah, just to add on, I think it's a great program. I think realistically, if you're entering the federal um, sector for the first time, Think about a couple things to get started as a subcontractor to build that relationship. And then that mentor protege agreement is maybe that next tier once you've got a few uh, bits of experience under your belt. Um, but it is a good, if, if you can get that first contract, that first thing, there are a lot of programs to support getting the second, third, fourth, et cetera. Um, so, you know, if, if, if it, it, is, it is a little tricky. You have to have an angle, I think. And, and Kristen gave some great tips about kind of some of the actions to take. 
to get that first foot in the door. Uh, but yeah, there, there are a, a robust set of programs from there on out. And, and, and yeah, I guess that's, that's the end of the thing. So we're, we're out of questions. Does anyone else have a question? Okay, so much time left. It's great. We can just talk. All right, well, thank you for leading us, Dan. This is a great conversation. Sure. All right. So if you, if you have any other questions, um, I don't know if our emails are available anywhere. And I didn't, I forgot to put them on the slides. So uh, maybe we can- Wanna drop them in the chat, Dan? Oh, that's a good idea. In the chat. Uh, yeah. Will this recording be shared? I uh, believe so. Um, yes, a copy of this recording will be available and I'll be putting the link in the chat so you all can check that later today. Here's my email. I think you guys can put in your own uh, emails. Yep, done. Great. Thanks everyone. Thank you all for coming. Have a wonderful day. Oh, have a good day. Appreciate it. Bye.